and welcome everybody to the Insurance Perspectives podcast. This is going to be our first episode in a five episode series on conversations with former captive insurance agents. On today's show, we have Nikki Henley of Extra Mile Insurance Solutions. Extra Mile has been a Hawksoft customer since October of 2020, which feels like a decade ago, but it has only been a little under four years. Uh, and they were brought uh, over to Hawksoft by none other than Brandon on our sales team. Uh, he's an excellent guy. I miss him. He used to be here in Oregon. Now he's down in Texas. Prior to insurance, uh, Nikki refined her sales skills working for infomercials where she worked overnight answering the phones uh, to sell you the latest and greatest product, such as the ab roller. Uh, this is research that was done by our podcast producer um, that um, I sincerely that appreciate. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Um, I, was given, I was giving him grief earlier for a pronunciation guide, but I, I want to give him credit for that, that type of great background. Um, I think it, it, all kinds of folks come to insurance. I was an English teacher before I got into insurance. Um, Nikki's agency, Extra Mile Insurance Solutions, is located in Owasso, Oklahoma, uh, where Nikki and her husband have seven kids, one grandkid, and uh, it says here that you're, you're getting ready for that empty nest phase um, and looking forward to traveling. With that, thank you so much for joining us, Nikki. Um, we really appreciate you taking time out of your busy day to join us. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm, I'm excited now since you dug up all that <laughs> <laughs> information. Um, this is uh, our second season, and, and fans of the show tuning in would uh, normally they'd expect a little bit more background on your insurance side. But that's a big focus of this conversation that we want to have with you. So the first area that I want to dive into is your background getting into insurance and, and working as a captive agent. Um, so Nikki, when did you get into the insurance space? Um, I got into the insurance space kind of like most people on accident. It was 2013. Uh, I was working part-time in accounting in a basement, no customers. I hated <laughs> it. I'm, I'm really bad at math, so it was a really bad fit. Um, and so I was looking for a full-time job since my kids were going to be in school now. And I had... Um, answered an ad for AAA, thinking that I was applying for the tow side, like some sort of admin or something. I had no idea about insurance at the time. I didn't handle our insurance at that time. Um, and when I did the interview, the owner was like, oh, you have to take a test, you know, to have this position. I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm good at tests. And then next thing I know, I'm thrown into this uh, insurance class and taking tests and selling insurance for, for AAA. Oh, wow. So... Um... It sounds like you're captive agent under the AAA side. Uh, in our pre-discussion, you had made an interesting point. Listeners who aren't as familiar with the captive side might not be super familiar with this, but um, AAA has kind of both avenues, right? There's a, a path where you operate as a captive and there's a path where you operate independent through them. Y yes. So that initial job I had, I was uh, working as a sales agent for another owner at that time. And back then it was AAA or, or you could write progressive if it didn't qualify. And then um, over the years, they started bringing on uh, more carriers that you could write through. And so it's, it's kind of merged now into AAA agents mm -hmm. kind of work like independent where they're able to write through pretty much any of the independent carriers um, that independent agents can, but they are regulated by AAA. You know, they, they don't... Um, own, own that book. Right. I mean, it's owned by AAA. I'm sure you can sell your AAA book, which includes independent, mm -hmm. but uh, yeah. So I was at with that AAA in the beginning. Then I left there and went to State Farm for a few years as a producer. And then after that, I left and went to an independent agency for about three years as a producer hmm. and then ended up getting recruited by AAA to come back as a corporate agent for them. So I didn't have like a standalone office. Um, I was an agent for the corporation. And gotcha. I managed my own book. It was really good training wheels mm -hmm. um, prior to going out and actually owning my own independent agency because, you know, you don't have all of the things independent does, but it's very similar. And mm -hmm. so 
that's kind of how I ended up with AAA at the end, okay. working for them captive. Um, gotcha. Because, you know, they so choose all of your systems and gotcha. carriers gotcha. And, and all of that. So um, joined them in 2013 and then started your agency in 2020. Um, but there was a stint in there with being an independent producer. How long were you a captive agent in total? Um, so I guess the last stint at AAA, about two years, probably four years in total between State Farm and AAA. Mm, okay. and, and then I actually opened the agency in 2019. Um, gotcha. Is whenever I had left. So my when I was actually a corporate agent for them was 2017 to the end of 20, I guess, 18. Okay. What, what made you make the switch fully to being independent? Um, honestly, it was to be able to have better options for my client. Um, mm. Because I did have some independent experience as a producer, mm. I knew there were so many more options out there. And there was things like management systems and raters and, and just lots of things that we could be doing that they weren't doing um, as a corporation. And you're always bringing them ideas and that nothing, you really can't change it when they're a big captive agency, that big, you know, they're, they're a huge corporation. Yeah. And so I thought if I could go independent on my own where I don't have anybody telling me how to do it and I can do it the way I want for the customers and not for the bottom line, um, I thought that would be be easy to be successful because it, it just seems like it's missing in a lot of insurance um, is the customer care. Sure. Absolutely. Um, I'm definitely going to swing back on that. But before we um, depart from your, your history as a captive agent, I would like to know, was there anything that you really liked or that you miss about being a captive agent now with your experience on the independent owner side? Uh, there are a lot of things. It was a lot easier because, <laughs> um, you know, you didn't have to think about what system am I using? What what technology, you know, are we using today? And how are we getting all of our workflows to fit in? It's just kind of like, you know, turnkey. It's handed to you. So you don't really have to think mm -hmm. about that stuff. And so that that was nice. You have no flexibility in what you're doing. Sure. But then on the other hand, you don't have to think about it. So that that was kind of good. And then, um, it's never bad having a big name backing you. You mean, I mean, mm -hmm. I don't think I'll be able to put extra mile on the NBA final backboards. Uh, <laughs> but when you're working for a big captive, you're getting branded constantly all over the place. So that, that is something that is nice about being captive. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's, um, often in business, there are really valid reasons on either side. And so that's why we wanted to kind of highlight that, Hey, there are, there's definitely appeals that draw people into the captive side. Um, but now we do want to kind of dive into that, um, the independent world like you did back in, uh, 2018, 2019. So the, the first question I have for you here is what was the hardest thing you had to do when you transitioned, uh, into the independent world? There's a lot of hard things. Uh, I think in the beginning I was pretty naive and pretty, um, overconfident. <laughs> so that kind of helped ease some of those things. You know, you don't know what you're getting into until you're into it. Um, trying to get appointments was, it wasn't terrible, but it was a little bit harder than I thought, especially on the commercial side. I was able to get the personal lines one pretty quick because I've been doing it for a while. And then also the staff and hiring in the beginning when you're starting scratch and you don't have all the cash flow coming in, but you want yeah. top people, it, that was very difficult to, do I try to stay by myself? Do I take out loans to bring on staff in, in the beginning? So trying to figure that, that part out and the mm -hmm. more of the business side piece was the difficult part for me. Yeah. Like I got you... a landline immediately mm -hmm. because that's what you do when you open a business, right? You, you sure. get a, sure. you get a plug in phone. Well, no, <laughs> I didn't realize that they have all this technology out there. So I'm still stuck literally in like a contract because I think mm. I signed the like five or six year contract for the phones. So just not knowing some of those things that um, could, could have helped me further yeah. down the road. How did you um, 
I definitely want to talk about appointments here in a moment, but how did you tackle that staffing question? Did you, did you persevere as your, as a solo person for a while or? It was difficult take- because I opened 2019 and as soon oh. I decided to let's go on my own. And then when I hit, start getting some renewals year one, I'll hire. Oh. Well, year one is from 2019, 2020, bam, sure. COVID hits. Which so that throws through a huge wrench in things, um, mm-hmm. but I did end up hiring a just like a younger high school student to come mm-hmm. in during COVID just to kind of do some um, things. She actually got her license and was able to help for a while, and, and so that was a difficult time. And then yeah. about twenty twenty one, I started bringing on people, but that's still been probably the biggest challenge I think. Yeah. Is is figuring out the best way to, st- to staff it. Yeah, I hear that from a lot of agents. Um, it's either an issue of like quality hires or the payroll versus expectation. I, I know it can be a huge challenge. Um, so I appreciate you you highlighting that. And I just definitely imagine- got in a big training mm. cycle. So I was able to find people who are willing to come in and excited about it, but they had no experience. So then Mm. I'm in this training loop of training all these new people and I'm not able to sell because I was the primary producer and then they end up leaving and then you have to bring someone else on and now you're training again. So it took a while to get, to get it where I needed it to be employee wise. Um, So if we turn then to um, the first point you brought up about the difficulty in getting appointments, what strategies did you utilize to get and establish those carrier appointments when you started out? The biggest thing that helped was to bring my track, my sales track record, even though, you know, they all want to know, well, how many sales do you have now? Well, I have zero because I'm scratch, but Mm -hmm. um, I made some graphs of my historical and pulled actual data from um, my sales at AAA. And even prior to that, like, look, I have a seven year history of, Mm -hmm high level producing for your company already. And Mm -hmm. they could go back and check, check it. And, you know, some of them are like, well, you had the AAA name behind you, or you had the state farm name behind you. And so I really just had to give them my vision on top of that. Mm -hmm. And so Mm -hmm. kind of my past along with what I was trying to do, and I was able to win most of them over pretty quickly. That's awesome. So um, it sounds like you might've started you approach AAA, you approach State Farm. Um, did you yellow pages, internet? How are you finding the people to talk to at, at carriers that maybe you didn't have a relationship with yet? I had a relationship with almost all the ind- all the carriers because AAA was the big ones, anyways. You know, Safeco and um, Progressive and and all of them. Actually, Progressive. I ended up just looking on their website, going online, and filling out the agent, you know, appointment request. It was a lot easier back then than it is today, of course, um, because of the market. But I would just stay on them. And most of them were pretty open to listening. I did end up joining a, um agency group where we it's it's not really a cluster, but, you know, Oklahoma agencies that come together to kind gotcha. of help. Probably sure. So if there's ones I didn't um, have, um, I could go to our group. It's called uh, the Affinities Group, and they're in Oklahoma only gotcha. right now. Uh, and be like, hey, do you have access to this carrier? And they could go and say, hey, we have this person, you know, we think would be a good fit. So that actually was a pivotal role in some of the carriers I wasn't sure about. But I had the top 10 in Oklahoma within a month. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, and I think that really speaks to the fact that when you – when an agent changes from being captive to independent, you're not starting over from zero. In a lot of senses, you're you're rebuilding, but you still had that track record. You still had that history and experience, um, and it still meant something, even if it even if this is big kind of foundational change in how you were doing business. It's still you still had that experience. Yeah, for sure. The way you know they're mainly worried about how many quotes are you going to be quoting, where are you getting your quotes from, um, and, you know, that you're capable of actually selling their product for them and that you mm-hmm. understand them. And I think that was a big part is that I spent a lot of my time throughout my career really getting to know each carrier, mm-hmm. what their appetite is, what their underwriting guidelines are, 
And if you really focus on that, you really can make a difference in each carrier. Cause when you get a lead in, you know exactly who's going to be the best fit for them. And I think that combined with my experience made it a lot easier to get the appointments. We can be as broad or specific as you would like with this. Uh, I'd love to know what misconceptions did you have about being independent while you were still a captive agent? I just thought it would be a lot easier that you're writing every single, Mm. every single one. Um, I also thought there was a lot of used car salesmen like independent agents. Now there's a lot more ways to be involved and find other um, independent agents. But back then I didn't really know any except for my one previous employer. Um, And so I didn't really even know what an independent agent really looked like and how you could, you know, succeed and help in your community and and do all that kind of stuff. Um, So I think that was kind of a misconception that they're, there wasn't really anybody doing it the right ways, which now, uh, sure. of course, through like groups like Hawksoft and stuff, I find all kinds of amazing agents doing that. So that was a big misconception that there was just kind of a bunch of old old men in their dusty sure. one-room sure. offices, you know, selling to insurance. That was my impression and kind of what I thought. Yeah. Um, and I don't, I don't think that's a an uncommon perspective on the space. Um, And I think that the last decade has been really beneficial to getting better voices out there and getting better perspectives out there. Um, Because that's uh, something we talk about a lot on this series, a lot on this podcast itself. And um, I talk with a lot of agents about is like, um, for, for my, like, I knew my family agent and you know i was fortunate that i had an independent agent growing up um that in itself is a very weird sentence to say almost none of my friends would understand why that would be a good thing um and so i I think that's a that's a belief that maybe a lot of people have is like why would i need something more than you know my state farm rep or my um auto owners or what have you the other misconception too is that i'm gonna be like millionaire by year one um, my husband actually coined the renewals as these magical renewals I keep hearing about that you're going <laughs> to someday get. And so it, that is another misconception of mm-hmm. kind of, you know, really how you get paid and the expenses versus, you know, the commissions coming in and mm-hmm. what that looks like um, once you do start getting renewals. And mm-hmm. uh, I just really had no clue, honestly, until I was in here to figure that piece yeah. out. Like, how do you know what your renewals are going to be? How do you calculate that? Uh, it's really hard to, there's no book to, to read to tell you that kind of stuff. Sure. Or there wasn't at that point. There may be now. <laughs> yeah. And I think there's a lot of, um, sounds like there's like a lot of like, in, what we'd say like in situ, like in, in while you're going through and the, going through the actual processes and you have to, it's going to take a year to hit some of those, um, renewals and like maybe a six month policy, maybe it's six months to, to get to that experience where it's like, Oh, this is, here's my renewal commission or here's my renewal bonus or what have you. Um, and so it's probably really good to telegraph that ahead of time for people that might be listening and thinking about going into the independent space. Were there any other beliefs that you had as a captive agent that you had to unlearn when you became independent? Um, I think initially when I very first made the jump, you know, and worked at the independent as a producer, um, it was very difficult because when you're captive, you feel like you're learning insurance, you know, you have the state Mm -hmm. test, but they, unless you just really go outside of the box, you're really just learning that carrier's underwriting guidelines. You're not really learning Mm -hmm. insurance in general. And Mm -hmm. so my very first, when I worked at the independent agency first, it was kind of surprising that, okay, I need to know what the insurance laws are for my state, not just what this carrier guidelines, because that's not a hard yes or no for every single carrier. That's just your, that's just your company. For example, State Farm, when I was there, we were telling everybody, you know, comp claims don't affect you at all. Well, as long as you're with State Farm, it's not going to affect you. It's not going to raise your rate. You know, mm-hmm. towing doesn't affect you as long as you're there. The moment you go to another carrier, 
Mm-hmm. So in reality, that, that does affect people when they're filing claims with State Farm. And at the time when we worked, when I worked there, I had no idea how much damage I was doing to, to customers for sure. their future sure. if they ever got dropped, which would happen. It's not like they chose to leave most of the time. A lot of times it was getting canceled. And now they have mm-hmm. six towing claims and they can't get quotes. So I think that is one thing that was uh, learning that you're not just an independent, you're learning insurance and you kind of know yeah. the rules in general. And then you apply them to each carrier per their underwriting guidelines, where when you're captive, some of the captive agents I've seen, they just, they don't really understand because they haven't done it. It's not something mm-hmm. that's their own fault. It's just to them, their underwriting guidelines are the insurance rules gotcha. for everybody. And, yeah. and it's different for, for every company. This gives me the perfect segue. I didn't plan this, but it gives me the perfect segue. Because the next thing we want to talk about is how how you've been growing as an independent agent. Um, so what resources did you turn to while you were figuring all of that out? Were there continuing ed courses or were there like insurance crash courses or a pamphlet or a book or like the advice of a, of a colleague or something? What resources did you utilize to aid in your transition to becoming independent? One of the biggest ones was finding other independent agents that were already out there. Um, and the best way to, that I found was to do it through Facebook groups. Right now mm-hmm. I'm in an agency owners group called the Mavericks. Uh, mm-hmm. I actually helped start, um, I believe it was last year, but I've been in other ones where it's a group and it's not just like a general insurance group. If you can find one specific to kind of what you're doing, um, then you can throw questions out there. Like, you know, what do you do in this scenario? What do you do in this scenario? And then you can start connect with people um, because, you know, I, I didn't really know anybody in, in Oklahoma at all. I actually mm-hmm. went to a conference for one of these group and met an Oklahoma agent in San Diego. And so then now we've connected and become good friends. We, it took us to get to San Diego through this Facebook group. And so um, I definitely recommend finding other agents in your same situation. Like if mm-hmm. you are leaving farmers, go find a farmer's agent that has left and open independent because, um you know, the independent agents aren't our competition. You know, we're not each other's competition. Even the one down the street, that's not my competition. State Farm is my competition. And um, the more you can collaborate and learn to kind of lean on each other for that kind of stuff, that has made a huge difference for me. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Not an ad, but totally if you would want to. um, What is the name of that Facebook group that people want to seek it out? It's, It's the Mavericks it's for independent agency owners only. Um, I know there are ones out there for agents as well. Mm-hmm. And it, it has been pretty essential for me to find those connections of people who, if I have a question, I can pick the pick up the phone. Hey, where are you placing this risk? Hey, what carriers are you using for this? How, you know, even th- what class code are you using on this commercial policy or uh, <laughs> How are yeah. you getting through the talk soft transition? You know, um, <laughs> sure. absolutely. That, that that's been um, really pivotal in in my agency, and I don't think I would have came this far without having those connections for sure. Yeah, um, I'm a huge fan of the saying "community, not competition," uh, which I steal from a local donut shop. <laughs> um, uh, which it, it's as funny as it sounds, but um, I li- I live in Portland, Oregon. We have a lot of donut shops, like a ton, uh, and they don't compete with each other. They they frequently promote each other's services, promote each other's events and whatnot. Um, and so one of the local places called Pips Donuts uh, c- came out with that slogan or started promoting that slogan, community, not competition. And I think it really applies to the independent agency space um, because I have never seen businesses that in theory on paper you would say like, oh, you're definitely competing for the same customer. It's like, well, no, there's there's enough to go around. There's enough um, people that need insurance that it's really about how do we help each other be better business owners. Um, do you have advice for other agents or professionals out there that are looking to go from captive to independent? Um, I mean, there are so many things. <laughs> uh, you know, kind of like we talked about learning your carriers and finding a mentor, really, if you can find somebody that's maybe a little bit ahead of you of where you're at, that you can um, bounce ideas off of and kind of see where they're at. 
And then the other thing is you don't have to do all the shiny things at once. There's so much technology out there and so yeah. many things getting thrown at you. Like you have to have this, you have to have this. Um, it's okay to say no. I had one of my mentors early on tell me that, you know, keep a list of the things that seem cool to you or that you want to try and just review it annually and don't just jump on something because mm -hmm. it's the latest and greatest because that can slow you down if you're trying to pull on every single new technology there is at once because what works for one agency may not work for you, uh, may not be a good fit. And we pick our technology by waiting until we have a problem. You know, this is not working for me. Is there something out there that can solve this problem instead of just saying, oh, this is new. Oh, this is new. That looks cool. I'm going to try it. Um, I may think that still, but I try not to bring those, those new technologies on unless it's an actual problem we're having that we need to have solved because you can just bury yourself in tech expenses pretty quickly and, uh, buy a bunch of stuff that you end up not using. Oh yeah. Um, and it, I think it always, um, catches people off guard when I give advice like that. Cause my, my role, my real job at Hawksoft is, creating all of those connections and, and making as much technology available as possible. Um, but we had a, a sales salesperson here at Hawksoft, Chris Lejeune, um, who was famous for telling agents, uh, scratch agencies, you don't even need Hawksoft, go work on appointments. Um, and that's kind of the philosophy I take in where it's like, what, what actual problems have you yourself uncovered in your agency Okay, then what pro what tools are out there to apply to them? What systems can you use? Um, what functionality might exist in the tools you're already using before you bring something in? Um, so I think that's really good advice to give to agencies is like, don't chase every shiny toy. Yeah, uh, they'll okay. be there when you're ready. And it doesn't make your agency any less because you don't have these. Mm -hmm. If you don't have the new AI answering your phone, like that's kind of the new thing out is having the mm -hmm. AI and that looks cool, but I don't really have problems with the phones being answered right now. So even though that looks really cool that an AI can do all that, why am I going to spend the money on that when phones are not a problem here at all? Yep. You know, I brought on some quoting technology instead because getting the quotes done in, in a timely manner is our, is our problem because they're taking so long because of the market. So that's the kind of technology I'm looking for right now, not a... AI to uh, answer the phone, even though it does. Yeah. I mean, I know it's good because, you know, it can take some time off some of your other people and answer after hours and on lunch. But like I said, that's not really a problem we're having. It's not hindering yeah. us at this point. And it's okay to not have that. It doesn't make us a less of agency. And I feel like sometimes newer independents feel like if they don't say, oh, I have a VA, oh, I have Lava and Agency Zoom, and, uh, and I have all those things, they're great. Um, for mm -hmm. me, doesn't mean I think any less of another agency owner that does not have that. Um, they have to find their path. Um, and if you try to just do it because everybody's doing it, you'll it will not work. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that is a powerful place to land us on. But do you have any other advice or recommendations for people who might be listening they might be sitting on their lunch break at, at their AAA office thinking like, I wish I could be my own boss or run my own agency. Any parting thoughts for that listener? Um, so I used to be like, there's not going to ever really be a good time to do it. Um, it's not as easy as you think, but if it's something you want to do now, I say that, but the market right now, <laughs> it would be extremely difficult to make the jump with it without some sort of partner, like a group that you could get with that could help you navigate the market initially, or maybe even work in another independent agency until the market opens up or something. But um, I think if I would have waited any longer, for me, if I would have waited till 2020, there's no way I could open in the middle of COVID. And so if you feel like it's the right time for you, um, just go for it because it's never gonna be easy. The challenges are always gonna be there. The market's going to be hard. The employees are going to be hard to find. Uh, <laughs> and so if you feel like that's the right direction, I feel like, you know, you should just go for it. Absolutely. Nikki, thank you so much for sitting down and talking with us. Um, I really enjoy this opportunity to get to know you better. Um, I love talking with Hawksoft agencies. I love talking with independent agents. 
Um, Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for asking me to be on here. That was fun. Thank you for watching today's episode. Click the video description below to learn more about our guests and to view the latest podcast episode as well as other content from Hawksoft. We appreciate you watching and hope you join us next time on the Insurance Perspectives podcast. Thank you.